I would like to call on stage our two co-moderators, Dr. Carl Middleton, Director of the Center for Social Development Studies through the Longhorn University, and Dr. Ruth Midi Ong Sakul, Senior Program Manage Manager, Australian Embassy in Thailand. They are here for the reporting back session, um, Key Climate Policy Actions for the Region and Pathways to COP28. Thank you so much. Could we also invite the uh, the moderators onto the stage as well? Is that okay? Okay, so we're getting towards the second half of the afternoon, which is an important session in the sense that we will try to pull many of these discussions together. Um, thank you so much to the illustrator for sharing this um, really good, clear summary so far of the meeting. Um, so in this session, we're aiming to connect together the knowledge shared and that's been deliberated in the parallel sessions. Today, so far, we've heard how climate resilience in the Mekong region is a complex issue that has physical, ecological, economic, social, and technical dimensions. It's also been very much underscored since the beginning of the day that this is like an urgent issue. For example, we heard that there's a need to reduce global emissions by 48% within six years. But we've also heard the possible ways forward to achieve goals like this. It's also been underscored how the connections between science and policy will be crucial, as we'll be communicating science to the public, and facilitating broad-based public discussions uh, bet uh, bet between the public and also communicating with the public with a wide number of state and non-state organizations and individuals. We've also heard about the co-production of knowledge, which I think is a theme that many of those in the room are interested in. I think also what I found very interesting is how the emotional dimension has been drawn out. We've heard that um, there's pessimism, optimism, panic, happiness, and well-being. And it seems important to me, at least, to kind of recognize that in addition to the technical part and the science, the emotional dimension is something that really needs to be engaged with. And then, very importantly, we've heard of how climate change and climate resilience is a social, environmental, and ecological justice issue. So in this session now, we hope to pull together across these topics. Um, to begin with, just to set up the second half of the session, there's a, a QR code here. Um, so how we hope to um, host this session is to first hear back from the four moderators. Um, and each moderator has also been asked to kind of draw out a couple of the policy recommendations. And we'd like to ask you then to uh, engage first through this app to have a look at some of the policy recommendations and vote up those that you think are particularly important to discuss further in the remainder of the session. Uh, as well as uh, add in any thoughts that you have or any additional policy recommendations. So we'll try and uh, encourage a, a good discussion partly through this app and then in the room. Uh, so I'll hand over to Kungay to introduce the moderators. Yes, um, thank you very much, Dr. Kao. And um, we are pleased to have um, the four moderators. If Dr. Puri is already here, um, please join us on this date. So we have um, Dr. Tanapon Piman from the SEIS here from the Extreme Weather uh, Session, Ms. Elizabeth uh, Tipong uh, from the Beauty Bill from the Food Security Session, Dr. Diane Asher from SEIS here from Urban Future Session, and Dr. Puri will join us shortly uh, from the Energy Security session. So um, first of all, may I ask um, Dr. Uh, Tanapon first, probably, uh, please um, summarize um, what you heard from your session, um, particularly um, focusing on the response of the climate impacts and um, possible solutions that the session suggests. Thank you. Thank you uh, for my uh, section. I think uh, it's very uh, first key message. I would say about the key message first when we link to the uh, recommendation. So what I can summarize in my section about uh, extreme events are uh, changing flow pattern or uh, sea level rising. I think uh, first of all, uh, 
people are aware about this uh, even through the observation through monitoring uh, uh, station or information and particularly from Vietnam Delta experience it's very strong message that we cannot fight with them anymore but we need to adapt you know or learn from large experience uh, how to uh, cope with uh, the extreme event secondly the extreme event it doesn't mean only uh, just weather extreme you know very heavy rainfall or or uh, uh, severe flood it have implication with the damage so that's why when define the extreme event somehow this term need to be uh, linked together you know uh -huh. and uh, the third part I think uh, from the MRC itself I think they show very good practical uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, warning and notifications uh, information to the member country and then this uh, information have now uh, uh, disseminate to wider uh, uh, local community you know it's like more use of information so however again this is also a next step you know after knowing information and what next you know actually we need that why this is a gap how we can collect the feedback back from community you know to support uh, effective uh, warning system so then I go to uh, two policy uh, recommendation that I uh, get from the uh, section is I think first one link to maybe a warning system but uh, I would like to use the word it transitionings you know from the weather warning system how much rainfall how much temperature where storm to the impact uh, impact based warning system so we need to go another step from weather to maybe the potential impact where they are gonna be impact to get more focus on decision making to deal with the disaster or maybe minimize the risk from the extreme event. Secondly, it's very clear that it's, it's very important to promote a, a community science because now they can easily access information to the telephone uh -huh, and they also can uh, show their knowledge in terms of uh, local monitoring that can also strengthen the warning uh, system and maybe also report back how effective need and also how they adapt so people think about the uh, uh, what's that the the real-time information of weather chain extreme event but we may think another way allow we need a real-time adaptation information too how people adapt that can help I think uh, uh, better understanding and maybe better planning in the future that's all thank you Thank you, Dr. Nafatanaphan. Um, may I ask Elizabeth to please uh, recap your session? Uh, thank you. So just as a reminder, our topic was on food security, but through a lens of social justice and equity and how that relates to climate change. And within what seems like a, a very broad or what is a very broad and complex topic, we had a, a, a wonderful panel that was able to address this through a lens of grassroots community based mobilization. We had a field based researcher with a depth of experience. We had people coming from a regional policy lens, and then we had people who were looking more at uh, practical applications, research-based. So within that very broad spectrum, we had so many different lenses and approaches. And so to try and synthesize this feels like a massive undertaking. <laughs> um, but at the same time, what we saw is that so many of these solutions were echoing very similar sentiments. Um, and a lot of that is that we can't reduce the concept of food security to food production. And I think that that's been one of the critical underlying messages that's coming through. We saw this come out of the results of COP27, is that food security in and of itself is such a complex issue and that we saw from one of the speakers how this relates to nutrition. So food security has to do a lot with that. If we look at the rights-based approaches of the people who are responsible for our food, 
but who have such limited access to the very food that they're producing. Um, and then again, from the regional perspectives, um, for how are we limiting or creating barriers in trying to actually solve some of these issues. Um, so these are very complex issues that we're trying to address. Um, is our in intervention causing more problems? Um, so I, I don't want to reduce it by saying taking a holistic approach or make it sound like it's overly sentimental, um, because I think that was also one of the things that came up in a conversation following the panel is that the term holistic can often make it sound like it's a win-win solution or that we're somehow buffering out the, the, the hard edges. But it's not. It, I think it speaks actually very much to the approach of the Mekong region of how work needs to be done here is that it's, it's enabling you to look long term. Is that taking that systems approach, if that's how we want to call it, taking that holistic approach enables us to work our way through the ebbs and the flows because there will be compromises that are being made, there'll be learning curves, um, there'll be adjustments. And so this was some of the, the key messages that were coming out of that session is that there is no silver bullet. There's not a win-win situation. Um, is that we have dug ourselves into a deep pit um, and that there are people who are struggling. Um, and so in order to get out of this, we are going to have to work through very, very systematic ways. We are going to have to look long term. We are going to have to do some very active lobbying in order to ensure that there's robust policy and also that there's accountability behind that policy when we're looking at our food systems. And again, we can't just reduce our food systems to a manufacturer producer kind of level because that's what got us into this pit. Um, so I think maybe if that's a, a fast summary. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, actually, in, in um, the, your session, Lai Jai, um, the panel also show many good practices, uh, very interesting uh, to, um, as a tangible action that showing what you just said. Yep. So, um, Diane, please um, provide some possible solutions come out from the uh, session. Thank you. Um, so the urban session, we had four speakers who are all very experienced with working with cities um, and city actors, um, including uh, more on the urban planning side, implementing uh, solutions uh, like uh, multifunctional uh, public space like uh, sponge cities and uh, wetland parks. Um, working directly with community organizations and community groups to support them in uh, improving their housing and infrastructure access um, and consequently their resilience to climate change, uh, working uh, with communities and cities to implement solid waste management and flood management, and also supporting cities uh, with grants um, uh, to implement uh, green city programs supported by ASEAN. So we had a range of um, perspectives and some of the key challenges that emerged from the discussion were firstly that many of the current responses are, to, are very centralized in that um, firstly the funds um, funds from uh, grants or like uh, climate finance very rarely flow all the way down to the community level, let alone to the uh, local government level. Um, and uh, is more often sort of stuck at the national level. We then take a very top-down perspective uh, on how funding should be disseminated. Um, there's also the issue of social exclusion. So uh, again, a very top-down approach to implementing housing projects where um, informal settlements might be demolished and then an apartment blocks built on top. Um, and in general, a lack of voice of um, local community organizations, but also local governments in negotiation processes, for example, with regards to allocation of international funds uh, down to the national level and then down to the local level. And in terms of the current responses that we're seeing, uh, a lot of them aren't really ap addressing some of the root causes or the underlying issues um, of problems. Um, they're not sufficiently decentralized um, and uh, not uh, sufficiently scaled up. So we might have lots of pilot projects, but how do we go from one community to covering all the communities in a city, for example? We did also cover um, possible solutions um, that we have seen being implemented already. Um, so um, processes that are more horizontal where different stakeholders at the city scale are brought together into a sort of network where they decide together how should we allocate funds, what projects should we prioritize, um, 
whether this is local governments or community leaders or private sector actors, all coming together in a sort of city network to decide how to upgrade or uh, implement uh, resilience building uh, projects or adaptation projects. Um, this also has the benefit of networking. So it's not individuals or individual actors uh, making decisions, but taking a more citywide approach. Um, and uh, one way of looking at it was to take an area-based approach as well. So rather than saying, um, okay, we're going to look at, you know, all the drainage infrastructure in the city, the approach is more to look at all the facilities and services and housing and social equity issues within a particular area of the city and involve all the stakeholders in that particular area in decisions around how to rectify and improve um, and build in resilience uh, and develop that particular area. Um, and uh, finally, just to say that um, when there are interventions from the outside, so funding that comes from an external source, this can be an opportunity to trigger a multi-stakeholder process on a citywide scale. And even if the funds are very limited, you can still bring in everyone in the decision-making um, and learning through the process in order that um, the lessons from the process can be applied to other areas as well. That's... Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and, um... It is really strengthening the, the importance of coalitions and the area-based approach for the city um, development. And uh, lastly, Dr. Puri, um, can you please sum up the session? Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, the session on the energy security and transition to renewables. So we have um, two key messages then that uh, energy security and energy transition can go well together, um, and some somewhat they, they can complement with each other instead of uh, substitute to each other. However, in the session we have discussed more on the supply sides, on the energy transition that we are going to supply uh, energy. Uh, renewable energy in place of the fossil fuel. However, um, in the session, we find out that to have a just energy transition, we have to take more uh, the other stakeholders in the society apart from the supplier that is the ele electricity or energy user and also the, um, the other uh, stakeholder like the regulator, particularly the role of the regulator in the regional power trade, so that the whole region going to um, apply or uh, stand on the same standard and we can like have a more freely and, and um, efficiently international trade. And uh, for the Mm, how how to respond to this just energy transition uh, apart from the technology and renewable energy um, the important thing is how to um, make the, the people uh, the, the general electricity or energy user are aware of the benefit or the core benefit of the just energy transition so that they are willing to join and then uh, they can trade off their own benefit for the global or the climate objectives. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Puri. Um, and um, as Dr. Kao said, um, we have asked um, each session to provide key policy recommendation for climate actions, um, and it has put up already in the v box. And um, Dr. Kao will instruct um, um, how we're going to do this from now. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so we, we're going to now try and uh, together guide a discussion or encourage a discussion. So. I think, I mean, at least for my part, like it's been a really insightful day. It's good to see so many people like actively and energetically engaging on the issue of climate resilience in the Mekong. And I think we've got a big ask now, like 
we're hoping to gather from the collective wisdom and insights in this room. You know, there's a, a lot of a lot of experience, many years of experience here. So we will try and use this app. We have um, you have two choices. One is to kind of vote up um, policy options that you think you'd like to discuss, um, and then also you can add additional thoughts um, if you'd like to. So how we'd like to proceed now is to maybe invite you first to have a quick look down the list and to vote up the uh, policy choices that you'd like to discuss further. Um, and then we'll invite uh, participants in the room to add your thoughts on those that are nudging towards the top. And also if anybody uh, on the panel would also like to add um, additional thoughts, uh, then please go ahead. So if you didn't get the QR code, it's just popped up here again now. I just like to add that uh, you could be either be sector specific as um, each of the panel chair um, talk about each sectors, or you can be um, like synthesis recommendation across sectors, or you can provide recommendation that see the linkage between sectors if you like. Thank you. Okay, so the at the moment the top couple of um, policy directions are involving communities in transition processes and uh, the second is to achieve change at scale that addresses some of the root causes of inequality in cities and beyond. It needs to be people-centered processes and systems and area-based approaches that can help to ensure all stakeholders within an area are included. Could we invite anybody in the room who would like to comment on these uh, top couple of either policy strategies and directions or specific policies to share your additional thoughts on these? Maybe from your own experience, how these connect to your experience? There's a lot of people in the room that certainly work in these policy arenas, so please don't hesitate to share with the wider group now your thoughts. Okay, thank you so much. There's a, a hand over here. So um, I think we might even have all the microphones on here, possibly. There's another microphone here as well. Thank you. All right, um, Ratana from uh, FAO. And I think the D2, involving community in transition process. Um, I think like, all of the people here will have involved already at a certain degree, at a certain level, community. Um, we have all adopted processes that are more engaging, that are more participative. We are talking about adaptation-led community. So over the last, let's say, 15 years, 20 years, there have been really like more than a concern or interest to integrate community into the transition, into the understanding of that transition. Now, the way we engage them maybe is not sufficient. Sharing the risk and making them understand climate risk is maybe not enough. Looking now about co-producing solution, this is the transition aspect, because what we are trying here, um, and I think that is very important to bring back the community, but we want the voice and we want the hands of the community. And this is really calling to over uh, comments that was in that chat, uh, which is calling as well to more action. Thank you so much. There's a response on the stage. I would love to build on that one. Um, so actually, if I'm looking at it as like from the just transitions process, um, I would also just encourage people to expand how are we defining communities. Um, because a lot of the times when we're looking at communities is very much from a geographical containment perspective, um, which is critical, especially when we are looking at very specific, like if it's land use planning, if there's resettlement involved, but also communities in the just transition spectrum can also mean sectors, it can mean businesses. And I think that we can very easily position ourselves as the better than, or we can vilify certain sectors and then we exclude them from these conversations. And keeping in mind that a lot of these individuals who should be engaged, should be part of this process, hold a lot of institutional knowledge. They're very much part of this process. Um, so I would give the example, Poland has done really good um, consultation process to transition out of the coal mining there 
involving a lot of communities successfully from people who were involved in that and going through a very lengthy and I'm imagining expensive process to <laughs> engage the communities in that, but asking them, what would you want? And they had a metric um, that they used. And so I'm not suggesting this to be a perfect system, but I'm saying that they did actually involve the people who were involved because they they knew the risks. They saw what was happening to their environments. They saw what was happening to their health. And so they said, would you want to move into an adjacent role? Would you want to get training to work in renewables? Would you be willing to retire early so you can stay in the actual physical community? They asked people what they wanted. They didn't treat them as outsiders or others. And so I think it's important that we reframe our vision of what community means when we are looking at this consultation process. Um, and so that would be my input on that. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, there's a hand at the back, I can see. Are there microphones out there? There's also one here. Let's take two. Uh, thank you very much, Katrin Eitel, my name. Um, I want to build on that again. Um, it's not only about defining what is communities, actually, I think, don't, but also to think about what means inclusive. So we talked about co-production of knowledge yesterday, and the question is also how we do that. I mean, co-production of knowledge implies already a jointly co-production. It's a joint endeavor. That means that knowledge is um, it's uh, co-produced on an equal level. That means that we do not inform them only about their whatever environment or hazards or challenges challenges, challenges that occur during climate change, but that we co co jointly, I mean jointly co-produce knowledge about it. That means in, in an integral way, not only inclusive. I think I wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thanks so much. There's a comment up here. So I just have one uh, comments or maybe share opinion that link to also the involving uh, community. Yeah, it's very good. I think if we can have a good uh, mechanisms, you know, to take community along the process of planning or decision making. But one thing that we need to be careful that you take a decision based on opinion or based on data science or based on information that is sometimes it's meek, you know, when you involve a lot of people, so you may get high vote, but that may be from the opinion, but it's not based on the fact that we see that is something that we need to balance or make sure science is our way back up, you know, on this process as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. I see a hand over here. Yep. Uh, thank you. I actually have two comments I would like to make. First, I think on co-production. Um, I spent six years doing my PhD on co-production and the outcome is just that it's a really, really messy process. Um, it sounds really interesting, very nice and inclusive and so on and so forth, but you have to realize that it's a super messy process, um, having to deal a lot with the contextual differences, the actors, the power and all of that thing that they bring into the process. And then at the end of the day, you as the researcher, or at least like the way that I write the dissertation, I have to make the decision on what is really the knowledge that is co-produced at the end. So I think what we are discussing, it sounds super nice, but when you get into the process, it's super messy. And then having to understand like what would be the objectivity, subjectivities that you bring into deciding what knowledge is actually at the end is co-produced. Um, the other point is actually on the all stakeholders within an area included or maybe like what uh, one of the facilitators was saying that like um, what we mean by stakeholder could just actually be those that are beyond a geographic area. I think that point is really important. And another point to that is that I think this is also very idealistic and sounds very nice, but it will be very difficult to do. And so the question that I would like to put forward to everyone in the room is, to what extent do you consider all stakeholders have been consulted? Um, for example, like, uh, I don't know whether you know, like uh, the new EU deforestation regulation, it is considered to be one of the most consulted regulation in the European history, with more than a million people actually consulted all over the world. When it came out, everybody is still saying that they have not been consulted. So um, I think all of this, it sounds idealistic and we should try to get there, but um, it's really messy. And at certain points, there needs to be some sort of a cutoff 
to say that okay, um, we try to a certain extent that is acceptable, but then you get into the question of what is acceptable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just like to draw attention to the next um, places of recommendation. Maybe um, the the number that have the fifteen words um, probably quite similar to what we just discussed about the people centers and area based approach uh, and the other one match the passion content in national commitment with intensity of action by putting in place clear equitable implementation frameworks um, anyone who endorsed that uh, would like to provide your um, explanation yes thank you Kevin. I think we also need to distinguish between the process of um, consultation and implementation. So maybe consultation is appropriate for policies and plans, but when it comes to implementation, we really need to have a really equitable and inclusive process. And one of the ways we can do that is to hand over the process uh, to the affected uh, stakeholders, whether they be a geographical community or a, like a gender-based uh, group or socioeconomic group, um, and then support them in that implementation process. So provide the technical expertise, uh, the professional expertise, the finance. Um, you can get more buy-in as well from local communities by asking them to contribute, whether it's their time or some of their savings. And this has worked quite successfully um, in many Asian cities where local communities have really driven the uh, upgrading of their housing and infrastructure. So it works. The challenge is doing this on a scale because uh, investments in things like infrastructure is really expensive. There's a limit to how much community savings will be able to cover the cost of this. And so we need the investment from above to really go all the way down to the implementation at the local level, rather than assuming that um, it always has to be implemented from the top down or like if we're investing in housing, it has to be the government or the private sector that leads the investment. I think there are different ways we can look at it. Um, and I think similarly, um, my examples are from housing um, because I work in urban areas. But if we're talking about infrastructure, you can also involve um, the local affected population groups in um, the building and implementation um, of this infrastructure. And I think we could also look at it in terms of, uh, for example, uh, ecosystem services as well, involving them in um, mangrove reforestation or other habitat reforestation, biodiversity um, improvements, uh, and so on. So just, just another angle, like going beyond consultation when it comes to implementation, uh, really trying to get that equitable process happening. Thank you. Others that would like to add? Are you sure? Would anybody like to add a policy recommendation that's beyond these top couple? I can see some others that have been added towards the bottom. This is an important opportunity to share your recommendation to a large group of engaged people. Um, I'm also curious to uh, maybe ask Dr. Puri about the, um, there's one recommendation from uh, the session of energy about defining just energy transition. How important is that? Um, um, many people also endorse this. Mm, okay. Um, in, in our session, we are talking about the energy transition to renewable energy, but apparently just energy transition is not all about on the supply side, but it's on um, the demand side as well. So during the just energy transition, what would be the roles of the energy user and the electricity user as well? Their attitude, the way they see how important it is to transition away from the fossil fuel, um, apart from trying to have a new technology or the clean technology to produce energy, but they themselves have to use the energy more efficiently. So that way we can reduce the usage of the energy. 
and that will help the transition to the net zero probably, probably like a, a bit more faster. Others. So any key messages that you would like to deliver to the COP28 from the Mekong region, for example? Okay, thank you. So just listening to what's been said so far and also looking at what's on the screen, um, and also thank you to everyone who's spoken already, I suppose I feel like we're, we're talking a lot about, of course, marginalized communities, um, human human-centered processes and so forth, but I wonder where is the human rights language in this discussion? And because you mentioned COP28, I think most of us who have been following the COP negotiation processes are quite mindful of the fact that human rights is often or are often not really spoken about in at COP um, and that there is a tendency as well in this region for us to sidestep questions concerning human rights um, in favor of discussions around let's say social justice and so forth so i wonder from the perspectives of those on um, up there but also in the room do you think we need to be more explicit in talking about human rights is would that actually be helpful in our in creating a, a more i suppose solid understanding of what just transition needs to look like very good question including in the context of the recent un recognition of the universal right to a clean healthy and sustainable environment uh, which is certainly relevant to this discussion on uh, climate resilience in the mekong region would any like to respond to this uh, suggestion is there a need for more of, uh, bringing more human rights approaches to this discussion? Okay, With the, there's one person on the stage also nodding their head very much as well. That's okay. Um, so. Yeah, I think I got called out on not being solution oriented enough already. But um, so this, unfortunately, human rights language at COP negotiations has been sidelined um, a lot. And sometimes, um, I don't want to say aggressively, but aggressively. Um, so it's um, been separated. So there's obviously there's the civil society participants, there's that community, and then there's the state negotiations that happen. And quite deliberately, maybe in the way that the COPs are organized, these deliberations with state parties are often very kind of global north centered. And then even the representatives who are coming from our region aren't able to fully participate in those negotiations. And human rights language is not a priority. Um, it's a massive priority for a number of the people who are there and for the people whose vested interests are there. Um, but it's not making its way into the negotiations very strictly, from my opinion. Um, but I do see nodding. So, um, I and so I'm I'm not offering a solution. I'm offering a perspective. I've been involved in a few of the cops um, there from a human rights lens, and it's at times quite disheartening or it's challenging. Um, I I've seen the 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 progress forward that's been made, and I've seen the steps backwards. Um, in terms of the firm stances that we need to be making, I think that we at a national level or at a regional level can be doing a lot more to um, inform the decision makers that are being sent. So whether this is in the, the local level lobbying that we're doing in terms of the key messages that go forward, pushing to have the, um, the NDCs at a higher level of implementation on the ground you talked about data representation. I am always, always arguing for the fact that local knowledge is knowledge, is data. Um, so how are we, again, broadening that perspective of what kind of data is being included into these negotiations, what kind of messaging is being brought forward, um, but then trying to create what is legitimately and not just like a tokenized safe space for civil society participation in these policy platforms, um, because COP has historically not been a very safe space for civil society actors. Um, so if you want to have that human rights language included in there, you need to make sure that the human rights defenders can go there and that they can participate freely and safely. Um, so yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The um, guy who called me idealistic, and I've got feelings uh, on that. <laughs> uh, um, actually, thank you for calling me out. But I actually do have something to share on this human right issue. And so in addition to the EU deforest uh, regulation, there is also the EU directive on sustainable, corporate sustainable due diligence directive. Or the, it's a really long name, but it goes hand in hand. Um, and the, the finding feature is that like now all the uh, companies that are now subject to the EU regulation also have to report on human rights and indigenous people in their due diligence process so that they are able to then place the commodities that are subject to the regulation onto the European market or the European market, the European commodities that are being produced in EU also are now subject to these two regulations before they can be exported. So. It is possible to get to that level where the language on human rights and indigenous people are actually required in the due diligence statement by corporations. But now actually we have a lot of uh, reaction from producer countries themselves saying that this is like too Eurocentric and very colonialistic in the approach that uh, all of a sudden now we actually subject to having to provide information on not just like legality, but also uh, human rights, indigenous people, and so on and so forth. The, law, the list is getting really long in terms of a due diligence statement. So I think it goes back to our early conversation that, um, of course, like uh, these two regulations have been like heavily, heavily consulted uh, before it came out. But now that it came out, it is supposed to be doing good thing. But for the people that are supposed to be like a benefit thing from that, that uh, produce a country, protecting human rights in those countries and so on. But uh, these are now the countries that are pushing back against these uh, regulations saying that it's uh, EU just trying to protect its own market. Question on that. Uh, do the producer countries have to acknowledge indigenous status? Um, it, in the regulation, they softened it a little bit by saying that it's actually following existing applicable law in the country of production. Mm. So uh, now the debate is like, what if the country itself doesn't have any applicable law in their country that speak to human rights or indigenous people? Mm -hmm. um, that is being still discussed because the law is supposed to be entered into application by the end of next year for big corporations and then for SME, it will be like six months after that. So a lot of discussion going on at the moment in terms of like how do we now actually operationalize these two regulations. Thanks so much. I mean, this is just very briefly also a way of broadening out the discussion as well beyond kind of just strictly thinking on climate change alone. For example, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights is also then connecting kind of the human rights obligations of companies to supply chains. So then it will also connect uh, private sector actors into this discussion as well in a more kind of a broader resilience discussion, not just uh, climate change alone. We have to hand over very shortly to the next session uh, that will be talking about communication. Um, so I think we should probably wrap the session up. Is that right? Yes. Um, well, so thank you very much uh, to the four moderators alongside these moderators who have summarized the, uh, the four sessions. And thank you to all of you for sharing uh, policy recommendations and directions forwards and your experience. Uh, so I think a round of applause to everyone in the room. Thank you. Thank you to you all as well for contributing. Thank you.